Oh, good morning. I'm Illinois Extension's Todd Gleason. Welcome to our Farm Doc Daily Live webinar. This is the first in the series. If you've signed up for this series, you'll be getting an, another email over time uh, in order to tell you when the next uh, program comes. We're planning to do these on Fridays and Tuesdays at 11 a.m. Today, coronavirus and ag. Uh, we have five Pharma Doc team members with us, including Scott Irwin, Nick Polson, Gary Schnicki, Jonathan Coppice, and Todd Hubbs. They'll make their presentations, and as we go through them, you can ask questions if you would like. There's also a way to uh, download the handout or the slides that you're seeing on the screen. You can get those through the GoToWebinar panel. I'd like to introduce Scott Irwin now. He's an agricultural economist here on the Urbana-Champaign campus of the University of Illinois to give us an overview. Good morning to you, Scott. Thank you uh, for joining us uh, from your remote location today. Thank you very much, Todd, and uh, welcome to all of our uh, uh, viewers and participants today. Uh, we trust everyone is uh, uh, safe and doing well. So, uh, I'm, my job is to provide an overview of what's happening, and I'm just going to start with this slide. We've all probably seen something like this, uh, the explosion in the number of coronavirus cases in the United States uh, each day. This is what we are dealing with and the associated health impacts from this uh, disease pandemic. So that's the starting point, what we're dealing with. And you can see uh, the uh, explosion. This is from a website from the New York Times. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. And probably most of us have heard about uh, what the country is engaging in right now is called flattening the curve. The idea is to engage in a something new that we're calling uh, social distancing, basically trying to isolate from each other to try to slow down the rate of infection of the coronavirus, uh, and in particular, to flatten the, inf in the infection curve enough that we don't overwhelm our medical system at any point in time. So that's the big picture of what's happening, but in this is truly unprecedented as far as I know in terms of uh, modern history and engaging in this kind of behavior of social distancing on such a widespread scale not just here in the US, but in particular also in Europe right now and other countries as this uh, virus pandemic spreads throughout the globe. Uh, this naturally uh, has caused a massive reaction in our financial and commodity markets, and that's highlighted in the next slide. This chart shows the change in four major financial and commodity prices uh, since the first of the year. Uh, this is through the close of trading yesterday, so it doesn't include what's going on today. And in today's environment, that can mean big changes. But this helps us just get uh, a perspective for what's been going on. Uh, the blue line is our stock market represented by the S&P 500, and it's now down in a little over a month. It's easy to uh, forget that uh, just a month ago, the stock market was at an all-time record high, and since then it has gone down over 30%, a total of a little bit under 30% since the beginning of the year. Uh, the other uh, big story in terms of collapsing prices is crude oil, where we can see since the beginning of the year, it's down almost 60%. That's not entirely due to the coronavirus. That's also due to a price war that's been spawned uh, between Saudi Arabia and Russia. Uh, on the ag side, we can see uh, by the uh, dark brown line that live cattle representing meats have basically gone down in concert with the stock market. Uh, they're uh, 
live cattle prices are now down a little bit under 30% on the year. Uh, the grain markets have actually uh, fared much better relative to these other markets. Uh, it, the corn market for the year is now down about 15%. Of course, what we're all trying to uh, analyze and try to game out is where do we go from here? Uh, one thing that I point I wanted to make before I close is that uh, we could be in a very strange situation where we may never equal uh, the or experience the technical definition of an economic recession, which according to economists is two consecutive quarters of negative uh, GDP growth. Uh, it is conceivable that we could, in essence, experience something akin to a contraction in economic activity in the second quarter of 2020 that without wanting to sound uh, too uh, extreme, it could be of a dimension of uh, something like the Great Depression. We could at the bottom in the uh, second quarter be down, say, something like 15, 20, or 25 percent, but end up recovering by the end of uh, the second quarter. Uh, it may be something that in agriculture we're familiar with. We talk about flash droughts. This might be a very severe uh, flash recession that we experience in the second quarter of 2020, uh, but perhaps recovering before we have another quarter of negative economic growth. So with that, I'll turn it over to my next colleague. You will uh, take uh, your answers now for this poll. Uh, how concerned are you with the risk of COVID-19 for you personally? Go ahead and make your answers available. And I do have a question for you, Scott, as they're filling out the poll number or the poll here. So answer this question or answer mm -hmm. the question on the page. Uh, how how uh, much of a relationship is there between the S&P 500 and cattle? prices normally. Uh, you talked about that a little. I assume that really doesn't generally work uh, on a regular basis. No. Uh, generally, uh, there's obviously an, an impact through demand for uh, livestock uh, use, but in general, that's a very loose relationship in terms of the general stock market. So we would it's unusual to see this tight, tight of a relationship. And we'll close that poll now. Thank you so much for uh, making your votes move very quickly. Uh, we're joined by Nick Polson as well. He's going to go through the consumer response. Nick? All right. Thanks. Thanks, Todd. Um, so as Todd mentioned, I'm going to go through some of the consumer responses that we've seen, some of the some of the highlights, and, and unfortunately, some of the uh, some of the lowlights um, that we've seen on the consumer side. So. Um, Jim, if we could yeah, advance to that first slide that I have there. There we go. Thank you. Um, so we're obviously in a situation of very rapid, very quick change. Um, and that has, has definitely uh, uh, applies to the, the food delivery system that we have, the consumers across the country. Um, so a lot of the things that we're experiencing on the grocery side, um, people coming in, higher volumes in short periods of time. Uh, grocers responses just for safety, um, trying to keep uh, uh, shelves stocked, either having, you know, changing maybe overall total hours that are open to consumers, um, reducing those hours to allow staff uh, more time for cleaning, sanitizing, and then restocking those shelves. Uh, and then even the, the hours that they are remaining open, if they're reducing, uh, having some of those hours restricted for some of our more uh, at-risk groups to shop. We've seen a lot of that happen here locally and regionally in, in central Illinois. So specific hours for the elderly um, or some of the other um, at-risk populations so, so they can get in and shop without, without everyone else in the store at the same time. Um, on the restaurant side of things, you know, definitely in Illinois and in a number of other states in the U.S., uh, governors have uh, ordered restaurants and, and bars to close at least to dine-in service. Um, however, um, at least in Illinois, and I think most other places that I've seen across the country that have done this, uh, they are still allowing restaurants to serve food uh, via call-in or online orders. 
and uh, shifting to curbside pickup um, or just expanding some of the uh, existing uh, food delivery models that they that they might have. Uh, next slide. So um, again, I've got, got some consumer responses here on the negative side, but also some on the positive side that, that we want to highlight as well. So um, again, we had one of the opening polls was talking about uh, asking you all about stocking issues in the grocery stores. It looks like the vast majority have have um, experienced that at least to some extent. There's plenty of um, evidence across the country of, of hoarding behavior um, and at least temporary, if not uh, slightly longer than temporary stocking issues, uh, especially for, for specific types of products. Um, again, I think the experience with this is, has varied quite a bit. Um, in more densely populated urban areas, I think there's, there's probably bigger problems than um, in smaller urban areas and rural areas, uh, but, it, but it has been an issue affecting everybody. I think it's, you know, it's in, in, in everyone's interest to continue to remind everyone that that type of hoarding and, and herd buying behavior is, is kind of a self-fulfilling problem. Um, so do your best to, to try to resist being part of that problem. Um, and then on the positive side of things, um, you know, a lot of kind of uh, good things that I've seen come out of this, positive uses of social media, um, if you can believe it, are a, a lot of community information efforts. Um, so just in our local area, just, just a specific example, people posting kind of centralized information about what restaurants are uh, moving to curbside or delivery service, uh, information about those hours changes or restricted hours for those at-risk groups at grocery stores. We've got a number of restaurants, both locally and across the country. We see news about restaurants opening up to offer uh, lunches to, to school kids, given all the school cancellations that we're seeing across the country. Um, and then even shifts in, in, in the products that, that, that firms are producing to help pitch into this effort. And, and probably one of the more noble ones that, you know, has at least a, a pretty close tie to agriculture is we're seeing a lot of distilleries uh, shifting into making hand sanitizer products for, for medical professionals. All right, next slide. All right, so just kind of finally to sum up here with some, some recommendations. First of all, the, the system, at least for now, is continuing to work. Um, so again, you know, panic kind of can create more panic. So recommendations, hopefully everybody has heard this multiple times, but we need to continue to get the word out about social distancing and quarantining to flatten the curve. Um, good hygiene practices, washing your hands and cleaning uh, surfaces that you're using regularly. Again, really try to go against maybe your, your inclination to, to go out and stock up on, on food and household items. Uh, again, there's really no need for more than a few weeks worth of groceries. Don't change your buying patterns you know, considerably from what you were doing before. You know, that's, that's what creates problems in the system. Um, check on your family, friends, and neighbors. We have lots of uh, technology options nowadays to be able to do that. Um, and I would highly encourage everyone to support those, those businesses that are being directly impacted very quickly as you are able. Uh, we want those, to, those uh, businesses to be able to survive this. Um, you don't know the, the length of time we'll be dealing with yet. Um, maybe my last recommendation there is just in general, you know, be be good humans. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Todd to uh, transition over to Gary. Hey, thank you so much, Nick. Uh, just um, to go back to the poll question very quickly, 91% of you say that you're concerned or very concerned about COVID-19. Uh, that uh, brings me kind of Gary Schnitke to you. I suspect they're concerned in two ways, one for their per personal health. However, the supply chain uh, and what might be happening in agriculture, I'm sure is a big concern as well. Yeah, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the supply chain here as far as agriculture. And obviously as we're looking at the COVID-19 measures, uh, this would is not, <laughs> at the very least optimal for what's going on in, in agriculture. You don't tr make these big changes in the way food is delivered and expect things to go well or smoothly. Um, most, as, as we've seen, there's been some, um, some shortages. Uh, most of those shortages likely are because of consumer behavior. Overall, COVID-19, the measures that we've seen to, to slow the spread of, of, of COVID-19, you would expect that not to have a large impact on overall food demand in, in U.S. I mean, the 
people that are exist here in the U.S. are going to have to continue to to consume food, and so we would expect the the overall demand for food to remain, remain relatively steady. There are going to be, however, short-term shifts in product demands and the way it's delivered. And again, we've just closed down restaurants, or very, very much so, closed down restaurants and closed down many institutions, including universities and others. Um, we're going to have to shift that food that was delivered from those systems over to other systems, most likely grocery systems, and obviously. Uh, making that big big of a switch is going to be be some work for our friends in the f- transportation and food industries, and they are working overtime, and we'll, we've got to give them give them that time to to work through those things. So there are going to be some shifts there over time, and Todd and others will be dealing with this. You could expect to see some change in ethanol and export demand that's more longer run i mean if we're looking at lower lower fuel use because of less travel um you would expect ethanol and to uh, use to change over time and export to demand to, to change over time as well however our first major concern is keeping our supply chains functioning and those would be primarily related to meat dairy, egg, and produce, those perishable commodities, we have to keep them them moving. Obviously, if we're dealing with biological units, hogs, cattle, dairy, they have to be fed. We have to keep uh, feed, veterinary supplies moving to those animals. So anything that uh, that uh, is done on a state and local level that impedes that isn't a good thing. Obviously, we in agriculture do know that um, and have been making those cases to our to our public officials. But, you know, as we're looking at some more and more, uh, more and more, more and more uh, draconian measures on the, the, the side, we, we can uh, expect to see those being strained. Again, USDA is responding to that. And the food and agriculture are responding to that and making that well known. Our first, again, our concerns mainly first concerns mainly revolve around workers and transportation, keeping those transportation systems running. Our question will be: Is how will we respond when our processing plants or others get COVID-19 infected workers? Given that we're just looking at slowing the spread of the disease rather than stopping it, it seems extremely likely that we'll get those that, that virus in some sort of processing plant, and how we deal with that um, is going to be a, be a concern. And we're likely to see be seeing some spiky, erratic prices at some supply points as people are making changes. Again, over time, we would expect to see some adjustments in our uh, uh, recession resulting of this. Scott, as Scott mentioned, this could be a very severe restriction, recession, very short term, because we're telling everybody to stay at home, and we're already seeing sort of that as we're moving into uh, insur- uh, uh, claims moving forward. For the crop sector, and again, keeping those food, dairy, egg, produce supplies chains working um, is a a concern. Also of a concern is keeping our our crop sector, particularly planting this year. Um, It would appear that all our fertilizer seed chemicals uh, uh, appear to be in place. But we have to maintain those transportation as we, uh, as we move into the spring planting season. I would also maintain or say that maintaining a COVID-19 workforce, a free workforce that's free from uh, COVID-19 is a concern. Washing hands, social distancing, and restricted travel are good measures for everyone to be adopting right now. Uh, we just sent a bunch of Students away from universities, so be careful as those come back to the farm. Um, uh, So uh, the other thing is, is we're planting here. I would would suggest that if we do have a COVID-19 infected person, I mean, there's going to be a lot of time time pressures going on as we're we're moving through uh, this period. Be be careful with that. 
We, uh, and Todd will be talking about this a little bit later, maybe seeing some, uh, some acreage shifts from, from this. At this point, you know, we, we've been doing, doing some analysis of what recent price shifts suggest for corn and soybean profitability. In Illinois, at least, uh, it may favor soybeans a little bit, but it's still too early to say what those things look like. With that, um, we'll open another poll. Hey, thank you, Gary. Gary Schnitke, of course, an agricultural economist. Fill out this poll very quickly. If you can, should the federal government initiate another round of MFP-like payments or low-interest loans to farmers? Uh, just one note, and we'll hear more from Jonathan Coppice on the response uh, from the federal government. The one pager that has come out of the White House to this point uh, does allow for the movement broadly of the pharmaceutical industry, healthcare workers, and it says simply those who are in the food supply. I suspect Jonathan will have more to say about that. Uh, and well, here are some of the results. Yeah, we're, we're closing the results for our Hopefully you're seeing those now, but uh, right now, 40% of you have no opinion yet. 24% of you think we should do something, 18% strongly. So 24 and 18 are where we're at. Jonathan Coppice is now here. He's the policy specialist uh, in the Farm Doc team. And Jonathan, uh, thank you so much for taking the time for being with us. Uh, you're following uh, something that's changing sometimes by the hour and a minute. What do you see? Yeah, uh, thanks, Todd. And you can go ahead and, and advance into the uh, slide here. Um, Jim, whoever's controlling it. So what we know right now is, as you said, got quite a bit of un unknown or uncertainty. Congress is in the process of trying to put together a stimulus package um, to help the economy and help kind of offset uh, some of what's going on. Right now, we're talking somewhere around a trillion dollars. Uh, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell released the Republican Senate version of this last night, but by all accounts, uh, it has not been well received. So I think we are in, in for a round or two of negotiations, both in the Senate and then probably between the House and Senate uh, before anything moves. One thing we do seem to have some agreement on, although you know, the details are going to be, to, to be determined yet is a series of, of direct payments or direct cash assistance to all a good subset of Americans as a way to offset uh, what's going on in the economy, whether that be lost jobs or uh, furloughs or, or some downtime and whatnot. So you will see, we will likely see some sort of stimulus package uh, very soon, and it's probably going to uh, contain some kind of payment to most people. You can go ahead and jump to the next one. So I wanna follow up with what was said earlier, both by Nick and Gary. Um, obviously our top priority is the, uh, from the food and ag space is, is the food supply chain. And then, you know, just sort of reiterate, uh, we're still, still functioning there, even with some localized challenges, uh, the hoarding issue, obviously we wanna watch for. One thing I wanted to highlight is under the Defense, Produ Defense Production Act, this was put into place at, during the Korean War back in the 50s, it's long running authority. And in that USDA uh, has a coordination and a lead role in food resource priorities and allocations. And in fact, the, the Farm Service Agency, which is, you know, not only does it make the payments that most farmers are used to, it's also a logistics and purchasing, purchasing arm for USDA. And so one of the things we uh, will be watching and we hope USDA is, is working through and presume they're working through very closely uh, is how to use that authority uh, make sure priorities and allocations are, are underway if there are localized food shortages or supply chain challenges. Um, we do know that, that FSA can purchase and can deliver or prioritize uh, supplies to certain regions. And that's frankly under the food resource, that is everything from, from obviously food products all the way up through uh, farm equipment and farm input supplies. So even on the input side for planting season and whatnot, we can see uh, the potential for this use to, to help prioritize and allocate if we do have uh, some localized challenges or issues. So that's something we'll be watching pretty closely. Uh, if you can jump ahead. Um, and I guess, you know, to weigh in on the uh, 
survey question there a minute ago. Um, from my perspective, it is way too early to be talking about another MFP type or other direct assistance, given that we have such vast uncertainties around the economy, around this uh, pandemic issue and response, and frankly, around planting, what the weather and, and the planting issues are like. Uh, that, that level of uncertainty really counsels uh, against Russia, having USDA rush into uh, another payment system or another payment program. And sort of to, to tack on what Gary said, if we're looking at this uh, in the kind of emergency and crisis situation that we have, then we really want to prioritize. We want to prioritize our response and our efforts, prioritize the, the staff and the capabilities at USDA on uh, first and foremost, those perishable commodities, livestock, eggs, dairy, making sure that uh, we can keep supplies moving and responding to those localized challenges if and when they show up. Um, certainly the ethanol question uh, has been a big one. And I know there's some talk about uh, trying to see what can be done for them in the stimulus package. Um, you know, that's, a, that's a capacity that we certainly want to keep going, even uh, just like the distilleries. There's, they just made a, a brief change to allow ethanol plants to produce for uh, sanitization products like hand sanitizers and cleaners. So there could be a chance that that, that uh, capacity could be deployed as well to help. Um, and eventually, you know, if we're going to start talking about the planting season and, and acres and what, what those things look like, um, that, that should come before, I think, any direct payment program. We do have a strong safety net in place for, for farmers of the bulk commodities, as you guys know. Uh, everybody that just went through the sign-up process in ARC and PLC or the crop insurance uh, purchase decision uh, are, are, are aware just about how much of a safety net is out there. So right now, let's prioritize where we need to be make sure we've got food moving and uh, the system running. And then we can always uh, uh, come back later and talk about what, what a, uh, an assistance program might look like given what happens. So that's with my, uh, my two bits and I'll hand it back over. Thanks. All right, so go ahead and fill out the poll on this question. Do you feel our current demand destruction is short-lived or will it have longer repercussions in a moment we'll get some answers well we'll have some ideas of what todd hubbs thinks about this todd of course the agricultural economist here on the urbana champagne campus of the university of illinois by the way if you want to put some questions in for uh, the five farm doc team members to answer you can put those in just type those under the questions section uh, and we'll get to some of those as we make our way through this system. We've got about 70% of you who have voted now, and it looks like um, most of you, half of you, more than half, 56% believe we've got two months to a year uh, of some demand destruction, a short-lived demand destruction. Uh, we'll ask uh, Todd Hubbs now to join us and to give us his perspective on COVID-19 and its impact on the marketplace. Todd, thank you for being with us. Yeah, thank you, Todd, happy to be here. Go ahead and click through, Gary. So I'm just gonna do a general crop outlook. There's been a lot of discussion already in this uh, webinar about the duration and severity of the economic contraction. I sort of agree with the poll. I'd like to see it to be two months or even shorter if possible, but that doesn't look like it's in the cards for us this year. The discussion on the supply chain is key. If we can keep our supply chains in place, I'm looking particularly to our competitors in South America, China, and places in the EU. If we can see their supply chains start to break down, particularly in South America, that may be supportive to us as we move into the summer. It's just really uncertain right now. It feels like China and many of the Asian countries are starting to emerge from this, and I think buying could be there. And that sort of brings us, and I get this question a lot, you know, is China going to meet their phase one trade obligations? Based on the start of the year, it doesn't look like it. Um, they've got off to a slow start because of their the repercussions around COVID-19 in their country. They're well behind what they said they were going to buy in 2020. I do st still think they'll try to buy a significant amount of agricultural products in the United States as we move through the rest of 2020. And if there are issues in South America and other places, that will benefit us if we can keep our supply chains in place. So as we're moving into 2020, the idea around acreage, I think a lot of people are talking about right now. And I, I agree with Gary, it's too early to start talking about thinking about shifting acreage. 
with the recent price movements we've seen in soybeans and corn, the, the harvest price ratio in cash in central Illinois is not saying it's a no-brainer to plant corn right now. And we'll have to see how it moves through time. Um, but it's a little bit early. Let's see how this thing moves over the next few weeks. We may get back to business as usual or not as usual, but back to some sort of business a little bit quicker than many of the commentators are now speculating. That would be my preference, and hopefully that's the case. When we talk about corn in particular, particularly marketing old crop corn, I know a lot of farmers out there are probably on basis contracts that you've rolled forward. That may turn out to be a good thing for you. We've seen basis in corn weaken dramatically since this took off, and a lot of that's due to ethanol plants. We've heard of ethanol plants idling. The idea of gas consumption falling drastically looks like it's a foregone conclusion. It's just the magnitude of it. I wrote about it being 15 to 20 percent a couple of weeks ago. It may be worse than that. And on top of that, the Saudi-Russia price war around oil has driven oil prices down to really low levels and gasoline as well to where we see ethanol at a premium over gas prices. So in the short run here, a way to think about it is, you know, if this lasted two months and we saw a 15% contraction, that may relate to around 120 to 150 million bushels of corn. It may take a while for the ethanol industry to gear back up if there's a bunch of idling. So this could be a little bit worse. And I think you'll see basis reflect that. Exports for corn, we still need to expand the pace. I've been watching the Brazilian second crop progress closely as we move into April, May, some key months. If we could get them to short that crop a bit. I don't want to root for them to have supply chain problems, but if they did, that would be beneficial to us. And on top of all that, um, when we think about feed use, there's still a lot of livestock out there. If we can keep um, the supply chain in place, the first indication will be March 1st grain stocks. And I think there are a lot of quality issues with corn, so we could see some really strong feeding. But this may have implications for the second half of 2020 if livestock production scales back appreciably in the summer. So right now, you know, if you're looking to market old crop corn, I'm sort of in a wait and see mode. If we could pull out of this between May and June, we may be able to see um, prices come back a little bit. I'm not expecting a miracle. For soybeans, we're still seeing a pretty decent crush and barring any interruption in their supply chain, I think that may continue. Brazil put on a pretty good crop this year, but once again, will they be able to move it? I think China will show up this year. I think you're going to see soybeans and possibly if Argentina restricts trade, soybean mill exports, get some real strength. So it's, I don't want to seem too optimistic, but I don't think it's all gloom and doom if we can get through this in a timely manner and, you know, maybe hold your, hold your marketing for a little bit to see how this plays out. Thank you so much, Todd. We did have a, a couple of quick questions that have come in over time and we'll get to those. Uh, if you've got questions, go ahead and write them down. Somebody wanted to know, uh, actually it was John Adams. I assume this is John Adams from Atlanta, Illinois. By the way, John, congratulations uh, for being a uh, 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 master farmer in the state of Illinois. Uh, that is fantastic that that happened this year. I wanted to know how many people actually are responding to the polls, about 70% of you, and there are 465 that are online. Am I reading that right, Jim? I think so. Jim Baltz, thank you for uh, helping us out with that. So uh, a couple of quick questions. Um, this one coming in, do you think China and other Asia countries are starting to come back from this COVID-19? If so, what do you see that makes you think this? I think, um, Scott, because you gave us a broader overview, why don't you start us with that question? Uh, yes, you see it in uh, the uh, economic data that's coming out of uh, China that they are clearly uh, have, they're, they're recovering. Um, you know, the uh, hit that they took to their uh, gross domestic product uh, looks to be fairly severe, but all signs are that they're beginning to reemerge. And that uh, is at least a positive factor in the grain market. And you've seen this week in the grain markets announcements of a couple cargoes of sales to China. And I think that's uh, 
uh, helped to cushion the losses in uh, the grain markets this week. I don't know, Todd Hubs, if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, no, I think that's right. Particularly if we see issues out of South America with them being able to move product. I think as China ramps back up, they're going to need beans and potentially corn as they try to rebuild their hog herd, which seems like they're doing based on the information I've heard. We also see places like South Korea. They seem to have flattened their curve pretty well, and they've been actively buying corn recently. I hope to see that continue. And Japan's talking about sending all their kids back to school. So it feels like they're farther along in the curve than we are, and hopefully they can get back to some normal economic activity. It's always too important to remember the elasticity of demand for um, food products is relatively low. They're going to need to eat. And if we can keep our supply chains active, I think we can be competitive. We will be uh, staying online and talking to you for a bit here, but I know some of you will need to go. Uh, this will be archived uh, and you can find it. Gary, if you bring that back up, uh, you can find it at farmdoc.illinois.edu. This is in yellow on your screen at the moment, slash coronavirus and ag. We'll have a whole bunch of information there. The archive probably is easily is easiest to get to if you simply go to farmdocdaily.illinois.edu. Uh, and up at the top of the page, you'll see all of the social media buttons. Hit the one for YouTube. That's not in this list. But if uh, you hit the social media button for YouTube, it'll bring up the archive of this program and many other uh, of our programs, including the five minute farm doc. So that's a, a quick and simple trick and easy way to get to that. Also, uh, because you are already signed up, you will be getting notifications uh, for the upcoming events, including uh, Tuesday, the following Friday. And did you schedule four, Jim, or just three at the moment? There are Continue. Four. It's we'll just continue. Oh, it'll stay. They'll, as long as we keep doing these, the, you'll keep getting notification. You won't have to sign up again. Thank you, Jim, for the clarification. Up on Tuesday, we'll be talking to Jim Lowe. A Todd Hubs will return as well. Jim Lowe will be here. He's a, a vet med infectious disease expert. I've talked to him a couple of times on the radio if you listen to our programming on WILL. Uh, and he's really good at explaining how the livestock perspective can be deployed as it relates to human activity. Uh, and uh, we can uh, listen to that at 11 o'clock. Again, these are Tuesdays at 11 and Fridays at 11, and you'll be getting notifications as time goes by. Now, uh, another question uh, about the marketplace. Uh, somebody wants to know how feed usage will be affected with ethanol plants shutting down. Of course, DDG is going into the feed market pretty heavily. Have we considered what that means for corn uh, and whether more bushels of corn, I suppose, could be going into feed rations rather than the DGGs? And uh, if that makes much of a difference, uh, I suppose, Todd Hubs, that's probably a question for you. Yeah, and I, and I sort of briefly hit that in my short time. I think the second quarter may not be as bad for feed usage if we can keep the meat supply chain moving. My concern is if with the price drop in the livestock sector, we see a scaling back, a significant scaling back in the second half of 2020. But for this marketing year, I think you'll see a pretty strong feed usage for corn um, through this second quarter of the marketing and the third quarter of the marketing year. Um, it's yet to be seen, and I know there's a lot of problems in the livestock sector with this price collapse and worries about their supply chain. So hopefully we can keep that in place, and I think that is something to look at as we move through um, 2020. So let's take a look at another question that just came in. What would be your suggestion to those who need to meet cash flow obligations this spring with very low commodity prices, especially those who had tight margins in the previous year? Yeah, that's a good question. And obviously our financial sector is facing some strain too, as we're moving through, uh, uh, through, this, through, this, uh, this, through this affair. One important to note is that our financial institutions that are servicing farmers are up and running. They're making some uh, some adjustments. Um, most of those institutions are closing their doors to in-face meetings, but are will, are 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 uh, 
moving forward with a uh, with business they have funds and can make make loans and we'll be doing those through the uh, through the normal normal or not normal but through through non face to face meetings in in many cases and we've seen a lot of lenders um, close their lobbies and close their doors uh, again but the uh, the the money for existing loans is there i guess if you're looking at a bright side their interest rates are very low right now and will likely continue to be very low moving moving into the future um hopefully most of our crop farms have made have gotten their loans renewed by this stamp this point in time so that those those funds still exist and everything is is going to to move through those fine um, livestock and dairy producers may want to begin talking to their lenders and others about the financial needs that may be resulting from this. And I guess talking to lenders sooner rather than later will begin 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 that process. One other note on the financial institution side is that a number of individuals are recommending that uh, people maintain a cash balance and, and, and withdrawing cash in this case. That's all well and good measure until you figure out that uh, there's a limited supply of cash that exists out there. And if everybody goes out and tries to get cash at the same point in time, it's not, it, it'd be a run on paper money. Uh, our financial system will be just fine if we don't, uh, if we, and so the, uh, we're not expecting anything bad to happen to our financial system, but uh um, just 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 sit back and talk to your lender if you're a livestock and dairy farmer and if you're a crop farmer um, your loans are there a policy policy question for you Jonathan um, they want to know under the federal motor carrier uh, act and I don't know whether that's actually the right uh, term if uh, movement is restricted uh, how movement off the farm into the system will take place or if it can take place? Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a good question and that uh, I don't have the specifics or the detail on that. I do know from some of the information I've gotten around uh, different areas, like for example, California, that's trying to get all non-essential uh, businesses closed down and, and traffic stopped, that food and food production issues will be, most will have to be considered essential and whether they use some sort of process for uh, exempting any anybody going to and from uh, work in an essential industry like food production. So my guess is that as they work through this, um, they're going to be permitting uh, traffic in that area as much as possible. But again, I don't have the specifics on, on that and I can see if there's any any easy information that I can find on it. Not not overly familiar with the Motor Vehicle Carrier Act. Okay, a couple of other questions or two questions related to fertilizer. Much of it or some of it comes in from China. Uh, how much of a disruption in the supply might there be? And do you see the strong li likelihood the Chinese defaulting on that $200 billion commitment to import U.S. agricultural goods? Um, let's go with the policy thing first. Uh, that's part of the phase one over a couple of years. Um, and Jonathan, uh, how does the U.S. and China uh, go through making that agreement work? Well, at this point, we're we're working through a lot of the uncertainties. I mean, that the the phase one agreement um, has a lot of aspirational aspects to it, and then they you know they're trying to work. They're supposed to work through any disagreements uh, within the the uh, bureaucratic trade negotiators and, and move move disagreements up the chain and try to get them resolved as quickly as possible. Again, I think you know what Todd Hubbs was saying is that uh, this situation with with the coronavirus really upends a lot of expectations when that was written. So I think it's a a lot more of wait and see um, and working through it as we go. Again, these are these are going to be tough situations where you prioritize and, and try to work through barrier by barrier and piece by piece. 
And we have had a couple of times, Gary, questions about the input supplies and them being able to move. Are you concerned at all about this? So obviously our phosphorus and potassium and nitrogen, nitrogen and or uh, natural gas does does originate outside the United States, particularly phosphorus and potassium. Um, my guess, not talking to anybody, is most of that that was going to be used this spring is already here. So that's probably not a huge concern right now. And um, nitrogen and making anhydrous ammonia and, and other nitrogen sources, again, we, we, we got to keep those supply, chain, supply chains moving um, and, and moving the, the, those products here from where they are at in storage. So keeping the in-country supply chain and, and transportation moving would be key to that. Over the long run, obviously, we've got to continue to import P and K and, 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 and uh, continue to convert natural gas into nitrogen fertilizers. Are there any concerns about the Canadian border being closed? It's open to freight or the Mexican border, which is the number one you know, a destination for U.S. corn. I I haven't heard any concerns about stopping freight yet. Again, you know, Scott, I don't know if you've been following that. Yes, I have on, uh, it was, uh, I saw a news item just this morning that uh, uh, the Mexican and American U.S. governments have reached some kind of, of cord for uh, the common border not to be closed. So I, I, I don't think it's going to be close. What other things should, should we do? Oh, go ahead, Jonathan. I was going to say, just to add to that, that it looks like it's just uh, people. Right. So the, the trade and freight, as Gary said, Scott said, that what they're trying to do is negotiate keeping people from going back and forth. Obviously, somebody's driving that freight. So I think it's a, wait and see approach, but um, they're working through it. Yeah, again, keeping right now, the concern would be keeping the transportation system going. The, uh, I mean, we have to keep that transportation system going, including uh, grain to livestock farms and food moving around the world. And hopefully our uh, political leader, or we probably on this call need to put, um, impress on our political and other leaders that that is a that is a concern and that we need to keep those uh, rolling forward do any of you know what we're doing to mitigate the impact of the physical movement of ag commodities across the globe so is there anything happening or have you heard of anything happening that uh, will make sure that uh, shipments continue I, I know it appears that uh, China has, at least from the reporting I've seen, has a problem with uh, containers being stockpiled there and being stuck in four, for 14 days. Again, I don't know, Todd Hubbs may, may, may add to this or Scott, but you know, you would expect, given what we're seeing on, uh, on containment side, to see some supply disruptions and again, Hopefully, we can work through those fairly quickly as we're we're moving forward. Um, you can't and you cannot do a massive uh, shutdown of uh, people movement without having some adverse impacts on movement of commodities around the world. There's been an awful lot of discussion uh, on the web within the media about the empty, especially on Twitter, Ag Twitter, about the empty meat counters. Uh, do we worry very much about the supply chain? And I suppose we can let Gary answer that, but uh, why don't we start with you, Todd Hubbs, uh, as it relates to keeping plants open and running. Uh, USDA has said on the inspector front that it, it has a plan to keep inspectors into plants um, if uh, the primary inspectors would happen to be COVID-19 and not be able to, or sick and not be able to continue to work. Yeah, I mean, there is a concern. I, this this is an unprecedented event and there's always concern and the uncertainty is huge. 
And we do need, and we've re, we've said this multiple times in this presentation, is that keeping those supply chains open matters. And it doesn't just matter for the ag sector; it matters for everybody. And to impress upon policymakers and people that make decisions, when it comes to isolating populations and locking down areas, to keep um, food distribution in mind. Um, I think this recent, you know, panic buying and hoarding of food uh, it seems like a natural reaction from human beings when we get in these kind of situations. I think as time moves on and hopefully things start to level out and we figure out if we flatten the curve or not, we won't get back to business as usual, but get back to where, and you know, the chains are moving effectively. Uh, Gary can add something to that if he wants. No, I would just reiterate the point that if we're looking at these livestock species, we're having we're going to have movement of uh, animals to slaughtering pants and other processing facilities go need to continue. There's no adjustment that we can make be made, particularly on beef. You know, the 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 breeding and other decisions take uh, years or so for those to change. Hogs. Um, the hogs that are being born today, and uh, we can't change that decision, will be ne will need to be marketed in the next uh, six months or so. And, and perhaps the one that can make the hard, the quickest adjustment is the poultry industry, but um, it would be very difficult for them to change as well. So all of those animals are going to, and livestock and dairy is going to continue to move on to through the supply system. And we need to keep that transportation system up and running and the processing plants going as well. And you can you can reasonably anticipate some choke points at uh, the processing plants as they particularly try and adjust to the changing demands of, of you know, products and the location of them. So, you know, uh, keeping that up and running is a is a key thing. Um, this is Scott. I want to make an observation there. Uh, we'll have some you know, relevant data to look at from the shelter at home orders that have been instituted for California and Governor Cuomo just instituted one for New York and how those are managed uh, will be probably an important uh, data point in identifying problem spots in terms of the food supply chain. Scott, I want to follow up with. Sorry, go ahead, go on, Nick. I, Todd, you, you know, when you kind of introduced that question, you, you kind of prefaced it with observation of meat being absent from the grocery store shelves. I, I don't know if that was part of the question, but I think it's important, at least at this stage, and who knows what the next day or weeks will bring, but you know, the, what you're seeing in the grocery stores, you don't want to confound that with assumptions that that's because of the supply side. It's, you know, we don't want to confound short-term demand spikes or shocks with supply shocks. So, so far, I think we're avoiding supply shocks, but you're still seeing things going on in stores because of the, the panic buying. So, um, you know, those will cycle through, uh, but the, the supply side is, uh, is probably the more concerning danger as we move forward here. Yeah, we, you know, as we see consumers buy toilet paper for whatever reason, we're 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 going to see something along that lines in the grocery stores with uh, food products as well. It's not likely now a problem with the supply chain. It's a problem that consumers are changing their cons consumption or buying behavior, and our system just is not set up to make large changes that quickly so again coming back to the consumer side you know the supply is going to be there if we keep these supply systems running and uh, every we'll, we'll be we will be fine it's it's a point of keeping down um, um, consumers doing hoarding activities Scott uh, we have a question about force monsieur can you remind us what that is and tell us if you think it would be in play very much during this situation? Uh, it's an excellent question. I'm going to defer to Jonathan Coppas on that to give us a legal definition and how that might apply under these uh, circumstances because uh, that is essentially a legal question. 
Yeah, force majeure is uh, the sort of act of nature, act of God sort of situation. So we usually think of weather events are the most common and typical. I do not know how a pandemic uh, spread by human to human contact would fall under that. Uh, so it's a fascinating question. Um, and it may depend, you know, on, I hate to make this such a gray answer, but it may depend on the situation, the contract or the, the relationship among the parties. But typically it is whether the completely natural, unforeseen, uncontrollable events. Anybody have closing comments before we decide to wrap up our webinar at this point? I was, I was, I was going to add in just on the on the China phase one purchases. I feel like we get a lot of questions about that. Todd gets a lot of questions about that. Um, you know, not to, not to add to any negative negativity, but the strong dollar and uh, low commodity prices are kind of both working against the dollar commitments that are outlined in that agreement. Um, I, I don't know if, if Todd or Scott wants to follow up on that, but just a, another thing to remind people of that, you know, China may make every effort they can to make those commitments, but they've got a number of things working against them this year. No, I, this is Scott. I just wanted to make one additional comment that uh, we realized that uh, there were a lot of questions that were submitted. We just don't have time to uh, address each one of them. Uh, and we do have a new coronavirus and ag uh, page at our farm doc website. And we have a place there where you can also submit questions. Again, we are not going to guarantee that uh, uh, we will respond to those individually, but is is a way to help us understand what is on your mind, what kind of the key themes are in terms of questions that are being asked. So just wanted to point that out. Thank you to everybody for joining us here for our first in this Farm Doc Daily Live webinar series. We'll be back again on Tuesday at 11 o'clock. We'll talk with Jim Lowe at that point, who is an infectious disease specialist at Vet Med here on campus, and discuss the perspective of livestock and infectious disease and how that can be deployed, uh, and explain some of the things that are happening with COVID-19. Todd Hubbs will join us at that point as well. Our th Thanks to all the panelists who have joined us today, Gary Schnitke and Todd Hub, Scott Irwin, uh, along with Nick Paulson. We appreciate you taking the time and we do appreciate everybody else who's been online with us. Uh, when you go to the Farm Doc Daily website, you can find the archive of this program as soon as uh, our own Jim Boltz has the opportunity to get it archived. It won't take him particularly long, but give him some time. Uh, simply uh, might be best just hit the YouTube link there, that little social media link, and it will take you right uh, to the YouTube channel that belongs to Farm Doc and Farm Doc Daily. Uh, for the Farm Doc team, I'm Illinois Extension's Todd Gleason. Thank you for joining us.